Uh, I love songs that are just so rich with truth. And we try to stay faithful to that here. That's a wonderful song at the cross. Holy ground. And we're talking, we're, we're studying through the Gospel of Mark, looking at Jesus Christ, the life of Jesus. And I told you when we started this study that if you read the text properly, you, you get this sense that as Mark writes down Peter's memoirs, Peter's reflections, of the life of Christ, those three and a half years he spent with him. Peter and then Mark, by dictation of Peter, are pushing Jesus to the cross. He needs to get there. The story needs to get there. And to benefit from the cross, you're going to have to have faith. Faith that can move mountains. And you hear that and you go, oh my goodness. And yet Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, mountains will move. So I want us to look today at this passage in Mark chapter 4, verses 30 to 34. A different use of the term mustard seed by Jesus to describe the kingdom. The apparent insignificance of kingdom labors. I hope you would take your Bibles and find Mark 4, 30 to 34. We'll put it up on the screen if you do not, do not have a Bible with you. And let's stand together and just follow along as I read this interesting parable that Jesus tells about the mustard seed. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown in the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. And then we're told by Mark, with many such parables he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples he explained everything. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. We're his disciples. Most of us here are his disciples. May the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, our teacher, explain everything we need for life and godliness. Thank you. Be seated. You see here that Jesus is continuing to link the nature of the kingdom to seeds. He's, he's talked about uh, sowing different soils. He's, he's talked about... Uh, the mysterious way the kingdom grows, sowing and then sleeping and going through daily activities, daily routines, and the kingdom advances. Now he shifts the emphasis a little bit here and uses this idea of the mustard seed, this small seed, to speak of the apparent insignificance of the kingdom of God when it first takes hold in the hearts of sinners. I say apparent. Because a lot of what's happening in kingdom work is not accessible to the, to the eye. And as we look at this today, I want you to, I want you to know that the image given us, Jesus coming in the incarnation, coming in very lowly fashion, a babe born to a young woman 
placed in a, in a manger, a straw container for animals to feed from. Growing up in Nazareth, with his mom and Joseph, his foster father, his, the one that God chose to steward Jesus. The way the kingdom comes is, in Jesus' life is so, so below expectations. And yet that very way that God brings his kingdom near to men is still happening today even after we know all that we know about Jesus Christ. We follow through the Gospels. We know that he declared himself to be the Messiah. We know that he was called that by others. We know that people are miraculously touched by him. We know that the religious leaders got angry with him and, and jealous of him and they had him crucified. And we know that he was buried and we know that he rose again three days later and ascended on high. And we know all these things. But have you, if you had lived in the first century, you would have been challenged as how, what to do, what shall we make of this rabbi, this son of Mary, to whom is attached all these amazing miracles, these amazing teachings, the ire and the anger of the, of the ruling religious class, And so Jesus teaches here, what do we compare the kingdom to? To help those who were following him, who had very different expectations, very different imaginations, very different scenarios in their mind about what it would look like when Messiah came. This mustard seed is the is the small round seed of various mustard plants. They're about usually one or two millimeters in diameter. I love the graphic that Linda put on the bulletin. If you just, if you just glance, you will miss the fact that there's a little seed in the palm of the hand, the mustard seed. If you laid that down next to other seeds, you would look at that and go, so what's going to come out of this? What can possibly come out of this? So Jesus is going to teach us, if we'll listen, about the growth, success, and harvest of the fruit of the advance of his kingdom. I want you to see in these verses for just a few minutes with me today. First of all, this kingdom of God, a question of comparison. Second, the kingdom of God like a grain of mustard seed. Third, Jesus' use of parables. We will focus on the second point. The kingdom of God, a question of comparison. He says, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? And here's where you, where you learn that while it is true that parables, the way Jesus teaches in parables, has a certain mystery about it, that would require him opening the eyes and ears of the, of the hearer, the, the seer, to understand it, it's also... The parable is also a story told from common everyday existence. It's a rhetorical question. He's, he's not asking for answers. He's asking to pique their interest. He's not doing this, one writer said, because, because of, to try to save face, being embarrassed to his followers because it's, it's not more grandiose. Certainly not what they had been taught. 
the coming of the kingdom would be like. It was a device used to sharpen the attention of the audience. So it's really the equivalent here when he asked the question of him saying previously, listen, be careful how you hear. If you have ears to hear, hear what I have to say. To tell this story to the Pharisees would only make them angrier. But to tell the story to those whose hearts and minds he had captured makes them hopeful. That's what I want you to be today. I want you to be hopeful. Because what he's describing here is the smallness of the entry of the kingdom in the beginning of this new era in time, this new dispensation. What should we liken it to, he asks. Well, let's see. The second thing we need to see is that the kingdom of God is like a grain of mustard seed. He says in verses 31 and 32, it's like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds of the earth. Yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants, puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Now, if you grow mustard plants, you probably don't let them get that big. You would be cutting them off much sooner for food. But they do get that big, even today, over in the, the region we know as the Holy Land. I've never seen one get that big, okay? But what I, when I read this passage, there is something that sticks out in my mind, and it is the it's the elephant ear. At Karen's home where she grew up, her dad had planted elephant ears. It's that big plant that shoots up in a stalk and then makes the various size look like almost like a heart-shaped ear, but it's, it's thought of to look like a, to resemble an elephant ear. It's hardy plants. The freeze would come and seemingly kill them. But here they come again. Am I right, Karen? You don't have to do anything with these things. Didn't we, did we have some in, in Clinton? Did we plant some in Clinton? I thought so. Because they just take over. They grow and they grow. And, and, you, and there's, oh, this is nice. This would be nice in front of the window. But they grow beyond the window. It's like well, you can't even see out the, through the window. You don't keep hacking at them. That's what I think of when I hear his description here. In their agrarian mindset, this seed they knew to be the smallest in, in of the seeds that they would be planting. So it represents an inauspicious beginning, a almost unseed, uh, an unremarkable beginning. Jesus is teaching them here that when he says the kingdom of God is near or the kingdom of God has come among you, that what he has brought will begin not as some grand battle conquering the Romans, not as some grand power move that will subdue all the enemies of God. That's for a second coming. That's in the plan, but not the way he came the first time. And so he's trying to help them to see that as they're looking for fruit, as they're looking for something they can hold on to to say, well, Perhaps this is going to get big. Perhaps, perhaps it is going to move in his direction. Jesus prepares them for small, 
almost imperceptible growth. You'll, you'll see the reality of that in John chapter 6 when the multiplied thousands of people gather on a hillside to hear him teach and when he's finished teaching he says to his disciples give them something to eat and you know the miracle the little boy with the, with the fish and the loaves is transformed by Jesus to feed the whole multitude then he leaves he departs from them and they try to find him they want, they want more <laughs> and he calls them toward the end of John chapter 6 and we're told at that time many turned away and no longer followed him now, ha think about this folks think of this place being filled to overflowing several times over and then in one sermon most of them leave And a dozen of you are left, remain. That's what happened here. What the roller coaster they would have been riding, where the now at last, finally, the crowds are getting it. The crowds are following him. They would ride this roller coaster all the way to the cross because it would happen again at the triumphal entry. And time is in between. And Jesus is preparing them. I think he has a word for us in this today. you don't measure kingdom growth on the grand scale. You measure kingdom growth as it works deep, imperceptible, but in the right time, in God's time, in harvest time, it grows to be something very amazing. He says when it's once sown, so first of all, you'd have to have the faith or confidence to say, I'm going to plant this little, whoop, I just lost it. Where, where'd it go? I got, to, I got to get another one. If you can hang on to the little thing long enough to plant it, to sow it. And then we learn from Paul and Corinthians that we water. We water with our tears and our prayers. And it, it breaks through the ground. It begins to grow. God gives the increase. And Jesus is teaching these Jewish background believers that in God's time it will, it will be a veritable tree that all the birds from everywhere, all kinds of birds can gather and find shade in its branches. He's as if he was saying, you're not seeing much now, but in God's time you will see something amazing. Historically, when the, when the missionaries were made to leave China. They were made to leave China by the Japanese when they invaded China in World War II. Not all of them made it out. Bill Wallace, uh, for, for whom I'm named, my name is William Wallace. My mom named me after Bill Wallace of China. He was martyred. At that point, China was closed off. After the war, China was closed off to the gospel, we would say. It was closed off to, to American missionaries being able to go back there. And the rise of Mao Zedong and communist influence there. The land of Lottie Moon and Bill Wallace shut off to missionaries. People with hearts, big hearts for the world, to take the gospel to the world. We're longing to get into China, wanting to get into China, finding ways to get into China. But you know what happened? When we got back into China, you know what happened? One of the largest movements in modern Christianity 
was taking place. Hundreds of thousands, unto millions of people coming to faith in Christ. The missionaries that had to leave left behind little seedling works. But it so often happens. The gospel grows deepest and spreads most when the heat of persecution is applied. This is why Jesus would link for his, for his followers the reception of the gospel to the sharing of the gospel and persecution for the gospel. This is why when I was in, in Russia teaching, Dr. Popov was his name, which is very interesting because he was, he was regularly popping up saying something. I, I, just, that's, I remember his name because of that very thing. He would pop up and begin going nine to nothing in Russian. And my interpreter was there and I would say, what's he saying? And he would tell, he would tell about when he was taken away uh, by the communists and beaten and accused of being an American spy because he was a Christian who identified with the Baptists in the country. And when he would ask us, back then, some 15 years ago, so was our Christians persecuted in America, and we said, well, no, not, not really. I mean, people, there's some folks that don't like us, but he said, how can that be? He had, he had no way to wrap his mind around that. Because the gospel cycle, receiving the gospel, sharing the gospel, being persecuted for the gospel was so interwoven. I've told you about this group before. I've told you I taught in their basement. And on the wall, I think, were about a dozen pictures hanging. I said, who are these fellows? Are these your pastors? And the answer I got was, these are our pastors who were martyred. You only get on that wall if you're killed. Going all the way back to the czars. Under the czars, some were killed. Then the communists. You could be a pastor of that church, and if you lived out your time and tenure there, your picture wouldn't make it on that wall. Those are the martyrs. So Jesus is teaching here that we should not despise the day of little plantings. That's important for you to know today. I look out among you, and, I, and there's, if we began to speak of your faithfulness, how you encourage or an encouragement in the gospel, we would be here longer than you want us to be here. Different, different ways, different emphases, different gifts, different talents, different strengths for all of you, but, but faithfulness. And maybe, maybe in that you're thinking, I don't see any fruit, preacher. I don't, I don't see any results. I, I have, I have sowed seed in, in the minds of some of our children who are not converted, in, in the minds of friends and family and loved ones and neighbors, fellow workers. And I've watered that with my tears. And I don't see where any, anything good has come. Keep watching. Keep waiting. Don't give up. And that's what I think he's trying to challenge them with. You see, within 40 years of Christ's death now, the gospel had reached all the great cultural centers of the Roman world. And many out-of-the-way places as well. For 2,000 years, the gospel has been spreading. Touching the hearts and lives from people of all kinds of races, all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of stations in life. We sing that hymn, from victory unto victory, his army he shall lead. 
Till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. I don't want you to get discouraged, brothers and sisters. And maybe some of you here today are discouraged. Maybe you're saying, Pastor, I don't, I don't see movement in terms of the Lord adding to our fellowship like I would like to. I don't either, brothers and sisters. What are our options, though? If we just say, I've had it, then we fall into the category of the people that we're studying in the book of Hebrews. Do we then just sit back and take our ease? No. This little, this little tiny seed, this mustard seed, this, this little gospel touch, this, this gospel word, this gospel act, this gospel deed, keep sowing it, keep watering it with tears and prayers, believing the Lord, that one day a great gospel tree will grow. The largest of all the plants, he says, to give shelter. Isn't that really what we want to be? Don't we as a church of the Lord Jesus Christ want to be a shelter for the hurting, for the down and out? For the folks burned by religion, spurned for whatever reason, well, I believe we are. I believe we will be increasingly. And I believe, because I believe the word of the Lord and I know the faithfulness of you here, the gospel shoots will rise from the ground and flourish and people you're praying for right now and things you're praying about where you can't even identify names because I, I, my prayer is Lord fill fill this place up to overflowing time and time again with people who are hungry and hurting whose hearts are prepared to receive the gospel I believe him that there will be that kind of growth. And I have to believe that even knowing that I may not get to live to see it. But I believe him. And I want you to today. Stop listening to the enemy of our souls who lies. Who lies to you about how, how you're not effective, you're not helpful, you're not pulling your weight, you're not... Stop listening to his lies. Some of you have been faithful to walk this journey long before I got here and in the nine years that I've been here. And then some of you have come on since that and you've, you've stepped right into the rhythm and the faithfulness of that. And we are, we are increasingly a family, a community, loving God and loving one another, wanting to reach out and serve the world around us. That's who you are. And you're doing it in different ways. So don't let the devil lie to you and tell you you're not. Because I can say this with Judgment Day honesty that every one of you, every one of you here who are followers of Jesus Christ, I derive encouragement from you at different times and in different ways. And I'm sure I'm speaking for other people here who would, if we had the time, would stand up and say, yes, I, I tell you what, I thank God for so-and-so because of how I'm encouraged to press on, how I'm encouraged to persevere. This kingdom work can be dirty work. It can, you get your hands dirty in the soil and, you, and it can be... Uh, Work that we have to have a delayed gratification, perhaps, to see the fruit come up. It won't, it won't spring up immediately. But when it breaks through the ground, that little, that little word 
that little deed in Jesus' name, that little cup of water, that little encouragement, that little plate of food, that little donation of clothing, that all done in Jesus' name will break forth. And by God's grace, the day will come when, when you will be astounded that such a kingdom blessing machine, an entity, has risen out of a small gospel demonstration. That's what he's telling them here. They were in danger of being discouraged because they were seeing the wrath of the religious elite growing increasingly against Jesus. And they knew that if they ever, if the authorities ever had their way with Jesus, that they would be next. They knew that. So Jesus says, I didn't come for a quick, instant kingdom. I appeared and brought the kingdom here, brought the kingdom near. And things will happen which will make you think it's moving farther and farther away or that you, have, you were confused about what was going to be the work of God. He says, I can tell you, the kingdom will advance. That the gospel will be a refuge for all kinds. And our text tells us that he did this with, in many such parables. The fact that that was his main teaching mechanism was parables. And he would teach so that some sitting there would say, well, I don't understand a thing he said. Well, you better hope he draws you into the inner circle to explain then. And others would say, well, that was, that was pretty, pretty clear. <laughs> One author said it this way. Large streams from little fountains flow. Tall oaks from little acorns grow. What's left for us to do then? It sounds like I'm beating the drum, a one-note drum. So, the seed. Even something as small as the mustard seed, when sown, will in due course show itself to be mighty and effective for gospel purposes. That's true in your life, in your circumstances, in your walk, in your words. As we go day to day, intentionally sow gospel seed because you're advancing the kingdom when you do. Let's pray.